David Rotkin's work has appeared in Le Monde and Stern, the New York Times, and, and many other publications. Uh, for the past three years, he's been working on drug-resistant tuberculosis in Moldova, in South Africa, and Mumbai. And, the, and we funded the work in, in Moldova. Uh, but we've also worked with David on, on what's, on, on, I think it's, you know, one of the really interesting parts of his project has been his initiative in seeking out new ways to tell that story uh, over and beyond the kind of traditional uh, news media outlets of seeking news media outlets. And so we worked together uh, to seek funding uh, for an educational website on, on uh, TB, the TB epidemic uh, that, that David put together in, in partnership with the EDC, the Educational Development Center in, in Boston, uh, and with help from the Eli Lilly Foundation. And, and then we've been working with him. He was out in Chicago uh, last week with uh, Mark Schulte of our staff, our education coordinator, uh, presenting to a number of schools there. And, and, and we're continuing that in DC and around the country to, to try to take that website uh, material and, and engage uh, use it to engage as many people as we can in, in, in this important subject of tuberculosis. David. I think when, when telling stories about crisis or conflict, it's important to move beyond simply documenting the harshest reality of a particular situation or purely looking for the peak drama or the peak action. I don't consider my picture successful if they reduce the story to intense emotion at the expense of greater context. That type of drama is necessary to convey the gravity of the issue, but the images have to move beyond pure emotion. The emotion should touch our hearts, but if the impact of the work doesn't ultimately reach our brains, then we've missed an opportunity to engage our audience, to inspire dialogue, and to shape the ensuing conversation. This kind of intellectual engagement is most effective when the audience has a reason to interact with the images and to spend time considering the story that the pictures present. In order to do that, the pictures can't simply inspire disbelief and sympathy, but they really have to evoke a sense of understanding and empathy. We're all bombarded with a constant stream of images and stories of death, disease, and destruction to such an extent that often we just want to turn away and stop looking. One conflict bleeds into the next, and one disease becomes representative of all disease, and all we can really do is process the images as the equivalent of visual headlines. I've spent, I've spent the past several years working on stories about tuberculosis, and I've traveled to three different countries where I've seen how TB ravages communities in unique and representative ways across the globe. TB, like so many news stories, is about more than just a headline or a statistic. There are real people behind those headlines whose lives are varied and complex and whose realities delve into all of the complexities and layers of a particular issue. It's the details of their life stories and of their struggles, and not just a visual representation of their health that can help us understand more completely that reality. The statistics concerning TB are alarming. Nearly one third of the world is infected with a bacteria that can cause TB, and 1.7 million people die from the disease every year. But it isn't a disease that can simply be defined by those incidents or mortality rates. What needs to be taken away from this story is not simply that TB kills. Among other things, the audience should understand how and why TB manifests in different communities, what work is being done, and what social and economic obstacles TB presents. In order to do that, the photographs have to show more than dying patients and their grieving family members. This is a disease that has serious social and economic consequences and whose effects reach beyond the individual patients who have it to burden and handicap the families, communities, and countries where it's found. The prevention and treatment of tuberculosis is a complex matrix of science, development, and culture. And <clears throat> throughout this project, I tried to make pictures that communicated this complexity. I wanted to relate how issues of poverty help dictate who gets sick and if those same people are able to get healthy. In India, for example, it can cost 20 cents to take public transportation each day to get treatment at a hospital or clinic. And this seemingly minuscule sum is often more than patients can afford, leading to them skipping their appointments, defaulting on their treatment, and putting themselves and their families at risk. 
In Moldova, a lack of understanding about what TB is and how it's treated has led to certain urban myths about the efficacy of medicines and leads to patients making unsafe and dangerous decisions about treatment. For example, not listening to doctor's instructions and foregoing potentially life-saving operations out of fear. And in some South African mining communities, a uh, grossly inadequate healthcare system leaves former miners to fend for themselves or at the mercy of sometimes poorly trained community healthcare workers who can provide inadequate or incorrect medicines leading to even more serious and lethal health problems down the road. And all of these are examples of details that inform the conversation about TB and public health in the developing world and also drastically expand our understanding of the story. They also happen to be details that require context and explanation, the kind that's often not available in a series of images absent other tools. So this, this work on TB has been published in a variety of outlets and I was happy with it being exposed to countless people online and being presented very nicely in print, but I felt like the intent of the project wasn't really being fulfilled. I was less interested in having people quickly flip through a magazine or click through a web-based slideshow, and more interested in creating a forum for an audience to really have a chance to spend some time with the issues and be given the necessary tools and space to think critically about them. I began looking for a different distribution format that could fully realize those goals, and with the support of the Pulitzer Center and a few other organizations, I decided to create an educational website for high school classes that uses the photographs and multimedia tools to guide students through the basics of the disease and through case studies in the three countries that I had worked in. The goal was to create a personal connection between each viewer and the broader issues of tuberculosis and public health and to show how those issues can manifest abroad and here in our own lives. The website functions as a standalone tool that presents the material, but it also comes with high, high school lesson plans for teachers that can help classrooms better engage with the images and issues, and it comes with an action packet that discusses some of the tools that are available to students who want to take the experience outside of the classroom. I think that difficult and haunting pictures are certainly necessary to demonstrate the severity of an issue and to accurately portray the intense pain that people experience. But if that's where the pictures stop, then all we've done is to create visual representations of statistics and to, and to reduce the issue to the variable of death and to hardly differentiate one conflict from the next. I think that our audience requires more to understand difficult stories of conflict and the people portrayed in the pictures deserve that their stories are about more than how many people will die this year or have an anonymous image of a person dying now.